morning, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here. I should say, I think I'm getting a cold, so I've got another voice to apologise for. Um, uh, it was very nice to see uh, the cover of the book that Robin and I um, uh, published 25 years ago um, on the screen just now. And um, I should say that at the time we did that, Robin and I did have the intention of keeping that up to date. And we did publish a few supplementary um, lists and, and then we sort of started thinking about a proper database and so on um, and it never happened. Um, <laughs> uh, we were both uh, occupied with other things but um, uh, I'm delighted to see uh, what we've got now and um, uh, that's exactly the kind of thing I would have liked to have gone on to do and I'm really glad that um, uh, it, it's being done. Um, but today, I'm not going to take you forward, I'm going to take you backwards in time, um, not in radiocarbon time, but in, um, uh, in years from now. And um, just to tell you about the early stages of um, uh, the radio, introduction of radiocarbon dating to European prehistory and the impact it had. Um, now, I'm aware that this is ancient history for most of you, but for me, it actually spans my whole academic career. I um, uh, did my undergraduate degree in the early 1960s, and what we were taught was a pre radio <coughs> version of uh, European prehistory. Um, so this is the kind of chronology of, of these early stages. Um, and although we were getting dates coming through in the 1960s, um, uh, the main um, thing that was going on at that stage was just discussion about the validity of the method and there were quite a few um, distinguished archaeologists who just denied that it could possibly be right because they were so invested in the um, pre-radiocarbon chronology that um, uh, uh, and the version of European prehistory that went with it um, that they just couldn't accept it and it was the work of Colin Renfrew really that um, um, forced all of us to um, uh, to accept um, and not just to accept that it was right but to start taking on um, uh, the implications and so on and it really was um, uh, massive um, because um, and I've obviously I've only chosen a few things to oh, sorry, um, uh, to discuss um, and I'm just going to talk about the abandonment of the diffused misinterpretations of European prehistory, um, the stretching of the time frames, um, and then what is perhaps not discussed so often is clustering of dates and gaps in sequences that characterise the early stages of the introduction of the method. And then I'm just to show you that I haven't completely abandoned the present, I'm just going to discuss one case study um, uh, uh, that relates to the present. So, the abandonment of the uh, diffusionist framework for European prehistory um, was a really big thing. Um, and it wasn't just that we had a different chronology, uh, we had to abandon the, um, the whole structure. And um, I've got, uh, this is, the next two slides come from uh, Colin's uh, book. Um, and that was sort of how it, the whole of European prehistory, uh, of um, later prehistory, uh, was meant to work. It was all introduced from um, um, the East and um, uh, spread across Europe in that kind of way, um, West and North following different routes. And I have to say that the, the quality of the slides I'm showing relate to the age of the article. <laughs> um, I'm, and I think it's better to keep these originals rather than uh, put fancy new versions of them on. Now, um, there were lots and lots of <coughs> examples, but um, um, the one that I'm going to illustrate oops, is this one that relates to megalithic tombs. Um, and when I dug this out again, I was taken right back to my undergraduate classes with Glyn Daniel on a course on megalithic uh, tombs uh, <coughs> of Europe. And, um, and it was taught in this way. And um, so when we got, and this was all altered by the, the what Colin Renfrew called the first radiocarbon revolution, just the the initial dates before we knew about the um, uh, the pre ring calibration um, and megalithic tombs were one of the sort of first things to go, as it were. And um, <coughs> we had to accept not only that we had much earlier dates for all the northern and western 
groups, but um, we had to abandon the whole argument of, um, uh, of how this spread. And, and we had to recognise with this topic and with many, many others, that the links that we had depended on were really largely illusory. And when I think back onto, um, uh, back to that course by Glyn Daniel on megalithic tomb, I realised that the links were all in terms of tomb <coughs> types. Um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't look at uh, tomb structures. Um, some of these tombs that are in early areas are rock cut tombs, others are above ground uh, built tombs. We didn't look at burial rites, we didn't look at uh, um, what was the material culture in the tombs. Um, it was all tomb plans that allowed us to build up this um, uh, completely um, false framework. And you've got exactly the same kind of thing um, happening with, uh, with all the, um, the other sort of structures that just collapsed um, uh, when we realised what the true chronology was. So that was a big shock to the system. Um, and of course, when we started to get the, um, uh, the tree ring calibration, which was not so much later, um, it made things even worse, and um, it affected later periods as well. And this is how um, uh, Colin Renfrew illustrated it with, um, uh, uh, with both in sort of time um, frame and geographically where this rupture came. Um, so we really had to kind of completely reorganise our ways of thinking. It wasn't just that we had different dates. Um, and so then if I move on to the, the stretching of, of the time frames, um, uh, lots of phases had to be subdivided. Um, uh, the, um, and in other cases, they were just enormously um, stretched. And actually the best example I can think of this um, comes <coughs> not from the Mediterranean, but from the British Neolithic, um, where uh, Stuart Piggott had published a book in um, uh, 1954, which therefore just before we were getting these dates, um, um, called the Neolithic Cultures of the British Isles. And um, in that, he argued that the British Neolithic lasted for 400 years. Actually, he did suggest there were other possibilities, but he went for the shortest one, which was unfortunate in retrospect. But um, um, and think about it, we now know it lasts for more than 2,000 years. So. Um, and that gives us a completely different um, um, understanding of what was going on. In 400 years, you know, they were all rushing around throwing up uh, um, long barrows and uh, megalithic tombs and causeway enclosures and henges, you know, non-stop. It was all sort of action pack. And now that we've got this all stretched out, you can see that the phases of, um, uh, of monument building, phases that are uh, much apparently more static and uh, and so on. So we have this kind of thing going on all over the place. Um, so then, um, and along with that, um, we made us really look again, and we've had to look again, at the, um, uh, the pace of change. Um, and a good example there would be the, um, uh, the Copper Age um, in the central Mediterranean, say. It used to be thought to be a short, really short, introductory um, phase, a sort of preliminary to um, the development of the full Bronze Age. And so it wasn't looked at in, um, in any kind of detail or, um, or thought to be terribly important. It was just, you know, as um, uh, um, true bronze metallurgy was being developed, this was just the, a preliminary first stage, of course. And we're going to hear um, a paper about this uh, a little bit later on, you know, we now see all kinds of uh, um, aspects of that, and it was a long phase, and it, it so it, um, and that was just one example. Again, we have um, uh, an understanding. We have to have a different understanding of social, economic, and technological change when we realise how stretched it is compared to the the version that I was taught in the nineteen sixties. Um, then um, the other thing I had picked up on was um, oh, I'll do that in a minute. This um, gaps in the sequences and the clustering of dates. Now, this to some extent was a, a temporary phenomenon, um, but when we first started getting um, 
I was going to say significant numbers, but I shouldn't use the word significant, which has statistical <laughs> implications. But when we started getting a reasonable number of radiocarbon dates um, uh, for um, uh, Mediterranean prehistory, but it applied elsewhere as well, um, <coughs> one of the things that emerges was these sort of dates cluster. And, and it, it hasn't disappeared altogether now, but um, it was very noticeable in the early stages. And there were gaps in the sequences. And this is something I plotted in, I think this was a paper I published in 1978, with my first attempt to look at um, um, uh, the implications of radiocarbon dating in the tree ring um, calibration for Italian uh, prehistory. And so you have to forgive me because it was a long time ago. But um, one of the things that emerged is just these hatched areas, which were gaps in the sequences um, um, as they appeared then. The left hand one, with um, uncalibrated dates and the right-hand side with calibrated dates, making the gaps longer. And this kind of thing happened in other areas too. Um, and it's, I mean, as I said, it was a temporary <coughs> one. Um, as time went on, people realized there were gaps. We, we got dates for them. Um, but um, I think it's something that deserves just a little bit of attention because it isn't entirely obvious why it should be the case. Um, the, you know, if you think of a kind of hypothetical prehistoric sequence, sort of cultures, periods, whatever you want to call them, in any area, when we started getting <coughs> radiocarbon dates, it's not really obvious why they weren't evenly distributed through those sequences. But they weren't, and they weren't in most of the areas that I've ever looked at. And um, I think it is worth um, um, asking the question why that should be the case. And my temporary uh, answer, anyway, is that um, there just are phases that are easier to recognise archaeologically. And I suggest these are, are, are phases of stable settlement and stable adaptation, which present themselves in um, a very clear way. And that other phases, which may be phases of uh, uh, social change, um, don't present themselves in quite that way. Um, so. As I said, this was a kind of temporary phenomenon. Um, we uh, did, um, in this, our area and in other areas, um, uh, uh, then fill the gaps. Um, once we realised they were there, we started looking for things. And in some areas, it was more significant than others. I mean, in, in Greece, um, they had to uh, create an entirely new phase called the final Neolithic to fill a gap between the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, which previously had been thought to be you know, one following the other. So um, I, th I think that's a sort of legacy <coughs> issue that we can, um, we can still address, um, or perhaps we ought to address uh, why it should be like that. Um, so, okay, where are we now? Um, uh, into the present day. Um, I would say, at one level, um, uh, we have a pretty good pre um, chronology for uh, the later prehistory of the West Mediterranean, uh, largely thanks to radiocarbon. And um, although, as we've seen from um, uh, the slides that we just saw in the previous presentation, um, it's patchy and the gaps and so on that we fill, um, it is the case now, and I think those of you who dig in the uh, Central Mediterranean will know this. We actually, when we send your samples off for radiocarbon dating, uh, most of the time you know what the results are going to be within broad limits and they really disappoint. Now, this isn't the um, an argument that we, you know, we should stop doing radiocarbon samples, um, radiocarbon dating, um, uh, but I think we need to think about a bit more carefully what we do. It shouldn't um, well, these aren't accusations that I'm throwing out to anybody in particular. Um, but there's a tendency, I think, for um, this just to become a, an archaeological method that um, people use. So you know, if you're in a period where radiocarbon dating is relevant, then you will collect your samples and you'll get them dated. And that is probably um, um, not the best way to go about things. Um, uh, I think we need to use... Um, the method more selectively um, and we need to we need to get 
better quality samples, better contextualised samples. Uh, we need to use the Bayesian statistics to, um, uh, to refine what we're doing. And um, uh, as I'm just going to, um, in my last couple of minutes, talk about the one example that um, uh, uh, I told you I'd give you for the present day. Um, the wiggle match um, uh, technique with uh, dendrochronology is something that can give us greater precision and uh, um, uh, can help us do it. So um, I think we ought to be addressing specific chronological problems rather than just sort of tightening up the chronology generally. And this is my example. Um, uh, the um, recently published article last year, um, and the, the title of the article tells you exactly what it's doing. Um, and um, this particular issue of the, uh, the date of the transition from the final Bronze Age um, to the early Iron Age in Italy is one that's been um, problematic now for really quite a long time. Uh, it was always traditionally given as 900 BC, um, and this was something that had been derived indirectly from the supposed dates for the Greek colonies in southern Italy and Sicily, um, applied to the material culture and, um, and then to the indigenous culture um, associated with it, and then taken to, uh, to date the whole Italian Iron Age. Um, and then um, the dates northern Italian Iron Age, which has always had close connections with Central Europe and the Hallstatt culture, um, uh, it, it, that proved to be problematic when we started to get uh, very precise um, uh, dendrochronological dates for wooden structures in um, Hallstatt uh, burials, um, which you couldn't really quarrel with, um, and that sort of pushed the dates uh, earlier. And um, by, um, uh, um, by extension, uh, that of the, uh, the early uh, Iron Age in Italy. And um, mostly, um, I mean, there's been a lot of work, and people have um, argued for various dates between 900 and um, um, 1000 uh, BC um, since then. But the general <coughs> tendency is for people to say, oh, I'm going to ignore all that and just use the traditional chronology, which is uh, a little bit irritating. But anyway, um, uh, we don't have uh, pre ring sequences going back from the present day to the Iron Age in Italy, as we do for Central Europe. Um, but the wibble match um, uh, technique, which I'm sure you all know, and so I'm therefore not going to describe, will give you greater precision. And this was applied to um, two uh, tombs of the very end of the Bronze Age um, 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 at Chilano, which is in the province of Lightwater. And um, uh, these gave precise dates, or pretty much precise dates, uh, for these two tombs. Um, and um, allowed, therefore, um, the, uh, a more precise date to be given to this transition, which is now suggested to be between 975 and 960 or 950 BC. So um, I'm going to stop there and uh, just to uh, indicate that um, I think the future is to be using radiocarbon to address um, really uh, quite specific um, chronological problems and they don't all have to be in this uh, relatively late period they can we have chronological problems in other periods but rather than just um, just one of those things you do if you're beginning a prehistoric science so thank you <laughs>